Cherry, okay. Cherry, okay, thank you. Sir, let us begin, sir. Let us start this session. Yep, we are set to go. Uh, very good morning, all of you. Um, I feel uh, privileged to extend my warm welcome to each and every one person here for the 12th day of B and Community Coaching Program for uh, Women Teachers, conducted by Ministry of Women and Child Development, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sport, Hello India, Fit India, and SAI LNCP Triandra. Without further delay, let us move to the session. So uh, today's speaker is uh, Sri Francis Sebastian, sir, um, who will be talking about organizing sport and events. And with lots of love and uh, gratitude, and let me read out his profile. Sir has a very strong background of a PE and community, uh, sorry, PE and uh, uh, sports science background. Uh, Sir has a strong professional background with the Master of Science, uh, that is MSc. Uh, he uh, it's focused about uh, fitness, exercise, rehabilitation, and uh, nutrition. Uh, he has done MSc from OMC College of Physical Education from Chennai. And uh, he did Bachelor of Physical Education from LNIP Gwalior. Sir is uh, passionate about promotion of physical education and sport for persons with disabilities. He is the General Secretary and Head Coach of Tamil Nadu Lion Football Association, a resource person for Special Olympics Bharat, and his school, Montfort at St. Thomas Mount, Chennai, was recently acknowledged as a unified champion school by Bharat for promoting inclusive education. Sir, with this, let me welcome you for the session, and I also welcome all the participants for the session. Sir, stage is yours. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Jairam. Uh, is my audio clear? Yeah, yes, it's fine. Okay, so I start my screen sharing. Huh? Is the screen visible? Yeah, sir. Uh, sir, please uh, go to enlarge mode, PPT mode. Yeah. Yes, sir, fine. Okay. So once again, a uh, very good morning to all of our viewers who have joined us from all around the country. I see we have a very good participation of more than 6,000 of you. And that is absolutely incredible. Thanks to LNIP Trivandrum, Sports Authority of India, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports for putting together this webinar. And today's session, I think is, uh, I mean, the sixth series is pretty special because we are focusing more on our women teachers around the country and trying to have this group exclusively for women, but I see that probably there are quite a few men also joining in. So welcome to everybody here. And uh, very at the, at the outset, I would like to talk about uh, what Dr. Jairam just said uh, about inclusion. Inclusion is the revolution. And this is a very important theme of Special Olympics International. And today, when we talk about physical education, health education, and sports in schools, schools should also find ways of including persons with disabilities of all kinds of disabilities, whether it is intellectual, visual, uh, locomotor, or whatever disability that they have, schools should find a space for them. And it's very important that physical educationists also create space for persons with disability to be a part of their sports and PE programs in schools. So that's what I want to start with. And uh, today we'll be talking about sports and events in schools, and we will be doing a quick touchdown about what happens in schools, the concepts of physical literacy, and then we will go into actual sports events. Now, when we talk about uh, learning outcomes, this is one of the most important things that we should do in learning. In any form of learning, we are always talking about outcomes. When children come to a class, at the end of the session, there should be something for them to take away. And that is what we call the learning outcome of that particular session. So the overall uh, goal of the learning outcomes that children can have from a quality PE program is fit being fitness and active lifestyle, sports pursuit, and the sporting excellence pathway. These are the three areas that we look at. When we talk about fitness and active lifestyles, we are talking about 
encouraging our children all the way from kindergarten to high school. And these are not the learning outcomes that are just exclusive only for school, but these are lessons for life that our children should carry with them when they leave school. So the desire to be fit and to have an active lifestyle, that is going to be one of the most important takeaways that children are going to learn from a quality physical education program. The second thing is sports pursuit. Uh, now, giving the opportunity for, in every school, we are going to find that there is a small percentage of the school population that is always looking at how they can be better in their sport of their choice. And this is where we start the talent hunt for the podium finishers. And when we spot them in school, we give them the opportunities to pursue this excellence. And the next part of it is where the excellence pathway starts where from school you go on to your zonal, interzonal, cluster, state, and then national level. So these pathways are very important parts for sports excellence. So we focus on three areas. One is fitness and active lifestyle, the opportunity to pursue a sport of your choice in school, and then to excel also in the particular sport. What are the daily opportunities uh, for sports in school? Now, when we talk about a, a regular sport, uh, school PE curriculum. Most schools might just have one PE period a week. Some schools don't have PE periods at all. I mean, I'm sure there are some of our PE, the teachers who are there in this webinar today. If I ask them, they might raise their hands and say, sir, we don't have PE in my school. I'm not doing a PE job. I'm doing other jobs. Like I'm in charge of the discipline. I'm in charge of this. I'm in charge of this. But I actually don't do teach PE at all. Uh, but the minimum required is of one PE period a day for children. Now we are always looking at finding ways of how we can accumulate 60 minutes of physical activity for children daily. So if they can get one PE period a day, which is an extreme luxury in many schools, you may not get that possibility because of the numbers. But if you have two a week and then there is supervised activities before and after school. See, some children come to school very early and in many schools in the past, that's where the actual learning took place because it was unorganized and unsupervised. Children led, children were leading their own activities, doing different things in school till the bell rang. <clears throat> but today you find that in many of the urban areas that has lost, in the rural areas, it might still be there, but children come to school early and they start playing. But there is no teacher, there is no coach, there's nothing, but they're doing it on their own but there is some kind of learning happening and there is physical activity happening. So the daily quota of physical activity is being met. The other option is substitution uh, periods whenever there is a substitution period. Uh, mostly what happens is like uh, if a teacher is absent, children come down to the playground and if there is space, they can start using the space to get active in, a, in their own way. You know, it's not going to be a class, but it's going to be a physical activity session where they're going to be playing a game of their choice. When we talk about the sports development pyramid for school children, we are talking about, uh, we look at the pyramid from the bottom. Now, when we talk about the bottom, we are looking at the whole school participation. Now, when we talk about the whole school participation, we are talking about the PE classes, uh, the sports, uh, and then we have the teams, the sports teams that are being coached either by the PE teachers or by outside vendors or specialists who come in to coach the teams. And then we have, International Yoga Day, National Sports Day, and the Fit India School Week. And these are all things where everybody in school can participate. So we need to have a real, real broad base. We're talking about a pyramid with the base being maximum participation. The next step about that is our intramural program. So when we talk about our intramural program, we are selecting students to represent their class and their house in inter-house competition, inter-class competition, school sports day, and also when we have the selections for the school teams. So a certain percentage of the school population that wants to excel starts moving one level above the pyramid, and that is the intramural competitions. From there, we start selecting our best to represent the school, and they are going to be participating in the inter-school competitions, and maybe the school is also going to be hosting competitions. And this is where the opportunity comes for them to really test themselves against better opposition and to also train and prepare. This is the more important part of inter-school competitions. It's not just about taking the teams for competitions, but it is the whole process of preparing your teams. 
if you are really prepared the results are not important it's the process is just going to be more important you know that there's going to be a uh, tournament eight weeks from now you select your team you start training them twice a week or maybe three or four times a week depending on the schedule and the availability of facilities that you have and you slowly start working on their fitness their tactical skills their technical skills their match practice arranging a, a, a friendly matches for them and then taking them to the tournament and then okay the result is going to be done if it works out well you're the champions it's great but the whole process of preparing for this tournament should be something that the children remember and they learn from it and this is where they're going to be learning about team spirit how to work hard to achieve a goal how do you support each other in your own goals and the team goals so all these things come into this inter-school competition from there the next level is if you perform well at that competition you are going to be spotted by talent seekers today we have scouts that are traveling around the country looking for talent in all forms of competition especially if you look at football and cricket you find that uh, the scouts are constantly looking at school tournaments you find scouts coming and sitting there you don't even know when a scout is sitting down that's when it is a real good scout he comes to an inter school competition and nobody knows who this person is but he's sitting down there and he's watching your players and then he's going to make an approach to your player and say hey do you want to come up to this club uh, and from there they start moving on to the higher level of state and the nationals so we have a very clear very clear development pathway for our children which starts with whole school participation intramural competitions inter school competitions cluster zonal competitions and federation and nationals now when we talk about the uh, the podium this is very important now the government of india in the past few years have been very strongly advocating that we need to start getting more people on top of the podium in our international events and of course the main goal is for us to get podium finishes at the olympics but to a certain extent if you have been following indian sport very carefully you will realize that currently now at the world level in uh, badminton in shooting in archery and of course in cricket we are right on top there but many sports now india is finishing the top 3 we are able to get people onto the podium now and this is just the beginning this is only the beginning but we have a very very long way to go but this podium finish uh, build up starts at the school level if you look at the figure that we are talking about we are talking about 33 crore children in 1.5 million schools around the country who are going to be a part of this broad grassroots development for mud sports from there we start moving on to the development the excellence and the tops which is the district the state and the national programs and here also we talk about how we have to upgrade our pe teachers and community sports coaches and that is what you are exactly doing now by attending this webinar we are trying to pass on information to you where you can help yourself to have a kind of professional development when you go back to your classes that you have ideas and inputs that you can use in your sessions when we talk about the expanded participation opportunities in school we are talking about outdoor leisure and there's a whole lot of things that go on where you can do different things inside your school to give more opportunities for your students to participate one we talk about and which very common in schools is our sports competitions so we have uh, inter school uh, competitions we have uh, intramural competitions some of them go for state some of them go for cluster so there are a whole lot of competitions that there are there then we talk about nature this is very important like you know physical education is also a big part of recreation and health education uh, the more we are able to expose our children to nature through scouting through treks through camping in the wilderness so we can do we talk about forest schools we can we talk about we can take a children to the nearest forest area for a day so that they can spend their day amongst trees and in nature sometimes if your school is able to provide the opportunity you can take them out of the school surrounding for a couple of days a weekend or maybe a whole week would be great if they can go and do a session and this would be something uh, a lot of international school is they, they they do this and they call this the week without walls and they take the whole classroom setting out of the school into a natural setting and the classroom is actually the physical classroom just moves from the school premises to a nature place and the same school happens there in the nature place some of the international schools do it 
uh, many of our rural schools are still doing that as a part because they don't have facilities. So these are things that you can do as a part of schools uh, coming closer towards nature. Then we have sports camps, which can be very popular for students. We can have uh, sports camps, holiday camps, theme camps, and training camps. Uh, sports camps, sometimes many schools do have weekend camps for training the students. Sometimes you have your scout camps, you have your RSP camps, your, I mean, your, uh, you, then you might have your NSS camps. So there are different kinds of camps that you can have. And also we have days where we have uh, uh, just a single event day where you have opportunities for people to participate, which is sports day. You could have a health day. You can have a gymnastic celebration. You could have a, a distance run. You can have a bicycle day. There are so many things that you can do to just promote sports and active participation in physical activity in your school for one day. You can have a yoga day. You can have a dance day. Uh, you know, there are so many things you can have a day where you have parents come into school and you have parents and children join up together and you have a community based sports competitions, which is not about winning or anything, but it's just about encouraging the spirit of being physically active, where we are involving parents also you can bring in one generation, maybe the grandparents also like you know, come in and be involved. Interhouse and interclass competitions. Interclass and interhouse competitions are a very important part of any school's physical education program. When I say it's, it's an important part of the physical education program, we it, this is where we start testing our children and give them the opportunity to start preparing for competition. Even though I stress very strongly that physical education should be more on the developmental focus, competition is also important for our students to find pathways to excel. We need most, we need all of our children participating and developing their skills and being active for life. But we also need to give the percentage of students who are totally enamored or who actually thrive in competitions. So we need to provide opportunities for them to take part in competitions. And this can happen through interclass uh, competitions and interhouse competitions in school. But very important uh, here is where I come back to what I said earlier, inclusion is the revolution. It is very important that schools promote inclusive and unified teams with modifications in rules to promote gender sensitivity and respect for each other. So when we are in including persons with disability, when we are including a gender, we are mixing genders and making them play, sports is one of the best ways to, to make people understand and sensitize themselves to others, respect others, and to know more about other people who may be different from them. So this is the best way we can do it through sports, in school, through inter-house, inter-class competitions. So to always try ways to, uh, to make sure that you have an inclusive program. Primary children now, when we talk about primary children, like when we do inter-class, inter-house for them, it's important that you have a separate sports day for them. Do not club their sports day along with the whole school. When you bring in the primary children into the whole school program, they hardly get time. So make sure that the, the primary school children have their own sports day and there are a whole lot of events that you can think of. I mean, I've, there's a few that I've put up over here. We have the races, the obstacle courses, the fun events, all sorts of things that we can do. Uh, the, the sky is the limit when it comes to your creativity. And there's so much resources that are available online that you can come up every year with different ideas and different concepts which you can implement into your program. Of course, it all comes down to how you have a budget, whether your school has the funding for it, Please don't let that stop you. You can always find ways of improvising. We are the kings of Jugad, and uh, we can make uh, we can find ways of improvising with anything in India. So make the best of it, and make sure that your primary children, that is from kindergarten up to class three, when we talk about lower elementary, that they always have their own sports day. And if possible, try and break it down even further where the kindergarten care, the lower care, KG and LKG and UKG have a separate day and then the grade one, grade two, and grade three, the lower elementary can have a separate sports day. We talk about middle school. Now, I mean, this basically is also falling in line with the new NEP 2020 policy, where we're talking about uh, the segregation of school into different areas of 
elementary, middle, high school, and higher secondary. So middle school is where now the children who have already got a good foundation in uh, sports and games and a, a very strong knowledge of physical literacy. They know how to run, they know how to jump, they know how to throw, they know how to catch. If you have done all these things with your children, when they come to middle school, now you can start transferring them into challenges. You can start uh, transferring them into sports and games competitions for them. And one of the more important things here is to make sure that your students have a very strong foundation in track and field, or as we call it, athletics. Track and field is the mother of all sports. And this has to start even earlier. I insist that we start track and field activities for our children, even from grade one onwards. The running, the jumping, and the throwing. All these three act these aspects of track and field can be taught to children at a very early age. And when they are, they are involved in these activities and they are exposed to these, they become better athletes. If they are taught how to run better, if they are taught how to throw, better, if they are taught how to jump better, then they can translate these skills into other sports and games. Because all sports and games require locomotive skills. They require manipulative skills. So, But these three, running, jumping and throwing, are one of the main foundations of locomotive skills. Secondary school and high school, again, it's a build up from middle school, but it's going to be more focused on, as I said now, the basics of track and field, that is the shot, the, all the throws, the sprints, uh, the jumps, and then we got to start bringing in the team games. So uh, whichever team games that you can introduce into your school, maybe your school may not have facilities for all the games, but you can always include certain games into your school depending on the space that you have. And also you can always modify. I mean, if you don't have a full, uh, for example, if you, uh, if you have only a basketball court available in your school, you can do basketball tournaments on that court. You can do five-a-side football tournaments on that court. You can do rink cricket on that court. You can do rink hockey on that court. So there are so many things that you can do in that one basketball court. So don't let your one basketball court limit your imagination. Uh, as I said, the sky is the limit. And if you can imagine what you want to do and you're willing to make the, do the extra hard work, you can provide opportunities for your children in most games within whatever space that you have. Over here, I've got one the thing is I mentioned that you look at number five, it's called the color run. Now the color run is uh, basically a fun concept that uh, many schools uh, incorporate. Uh, it's, uh, we are coming closer to Holi and the principle is something behind uh, the idea of the color run is something very close to Holi. So if the school wants to promote running, uh, distance running amongst the students, they have this color run. And normally the color run, uh, they sort of cap it at five kilometers. And if you have good runners, you can take it even further. So what happens in the color run is that the starting point, uh, children who are taking part in the color run, they sign up for the color run. In many places, they're given a white t-shirt and uh, with the logo of the sponsors, blah, blah, blah on that. And when they start the run, they're given one set of colors. Let's say it is red color at the start. So they put the red color on the children and they start running. When they run the first kilometer, that's at the next, uh, at one kilometer, they get the blue color. Then they put the blue color on the children. So as they pass each kilometer marker, they get different colors thrown on them. And when they come back to the start point, they should have all the five colors on them. And it's, there is no winners, there's no losers in this. It is just a fun run and children take part in these color runs. So this is another idea that you can always use for your highest, for the high school and higher secondary students. School sports slash day and week. Now, why is there a slash there? Because in many schools, what happens is the school sports is a day, a single day. And in the single day from kindergarten all the way up to class 12, you have a sports day which becomes very cumbersome. It's very tiring for everybody. And mostly the attention is on the high schoolers. What can, uh, is there a way we can do this differently? Why don't we break it down into the same segments that I spoke about? Kindergarten, lower elementary, one to three, upper elementary, four to five, middle school, six to eight, and high school and higher secondary, eight to 12. When you break your sports day down into these four blocks, or five blocks that they're basically, uh, it is easier for you to administer a sports day, which will actually give 
joy and pleasure to every single child who's participating. And you can promote maximum participation through this. When you have a whole school sports day, and if your school strength is about 3,000, the maximum number of people on that sports day who are going to take part in that, on that particular ground will be 10% of that school population. You might get, that will be less who will actually take part. But of course, you will do a lot of drills and you'll do a lot of dances and you'll have a lot of other things. A sports day should, it should, it should be about physical activity where the children are actually competing in physical uh, uh, sports activities. They could either be individual or team-based, but you should provide an opportunity for every single person in that particular class group to take part on sports day, either in individual events, team events or mass team events. And also in many schools, you'll find on sports day that there is one individual champion. <clears throat> this has been a tradition of schools throughout the years. You can always limit the number of events that a person can take part. And some of the PE teachers always tell me, sir, this is how we choose our, our athletics team. We build our athletics team. It is not necessary that you need to have a sports day to select your best players. You can do your selection during your PE periods. You can do your selection when you have an open selection. But let the sports day be an opportunity for every student in the school to get an opportunity to shine in front of their parents, their peers, and the whole school community. So make sure that you are uh, focusing on maximum participation and giving exposure to all students where possible. And that's why I talk about this uh, school sports week. So you can do a week of sports. You can have uh, the Monday could be for the high school, higher secondary. The next day can be for middle school. The next day can be for the upper elementary and then for lower elementary and then for KG, if you want to do it for a week. If you don't, if you feel that a week might be a bit too much, you can also do it in the term. You can do first term for the high school and high secondary. Then the second term, you can bring in middle school and upper elementary. And in the third term, <clears throat> you can have the lower elementary and the kindergarten. <clears throat> we have... <clears throat> I see quite a few of you have raised your hands. Uh, and what we will do is uh, I'm going to leave it to Dr. Jairam to come back to the questions. And uh, we will go through the questions as much as we can. And because Dr. Jairam will be moderating the session about the questions. Uh, I'll just continue through the slides and maybe I'll take a short break in between with the permission of Dr. Jairam to see if I can answer some of your questions. One yeah, of the most exactly. important days for us is our National Sports Day. Uh, we <clears throat> the, the, the birthday of, uh, just excuse me for a minute, please. Dr. Jairama, just give me a minute. I'm going to take a water break. <clears throat> uh, dear participants, just hold on. And, uh, you know, um, uh, your uh, questions are most welcome in the chat box, uh, chat box or in a question Q A box and uh, uh, we'll have uh, more discussions in the discussion part and your questions are most welcome. Apologies for that. <clears throat> I just needed to take a sip of water and come back. Okay. So we're coming to the National Sports Day. <clears throat> 29th of August is where we celebrate the National Sports Day and uh, the birthday of Major Diane Chan. Hockey are what we used to call our national sport. And uh, the idea of National Sports Day is to encourage the whole country and schools, communities, cities, towns, villages to have an exclusive day where we are focusing on promoting sports <coughs> in the community. And the best way for that is to do, to do a National Sports Day is to find a sport of your choice. It doesn't have to be anything. It could be anything that you like. Uh, whether and what is available in your school in your community or whatever it is or whatever the sport is popular in your neighborhood 
to promote that particular sports on a large scale so that you attract a lot of people to the particular event and people come to know that on the 29th of August is where India celebrates the National Sports Day. Now we have what is called the GoForFit go, uh, dot in, and this is also a part of the National Sports Day. And this was for National Sports Day 2020. It is still there. Uh, some of you can join this movement going to www.goforfit.in, dot in, where you can upload activities uh, what you're doing uh, through videos, uh, pictures, and also use the Instagram and uh, Facebook. And your school will be getting certificates uh, for all the participants. The Fit India School Week, uh, this has become quite popular now over the years, in the last few years. And it's a great movement to encourage our students uh, in schools about the whole concept about fitness. And it is not just about taking a class, it's about making our children understand what I was saying in the early part of our session. Being fit for life, being physically active for life and encouraging them to be active ambassadors of a physically uh, active life for the whole community. If our students are able to take this message back to their homes and talk to their neighbors, talk to their own parents, talk to their own grandparents, to their cousins and uh, their uncles and aunts and get the whole uh, family involved because they've been told in school that this is what it's, it, it helps. This is how being fit helps people to take be active for life. Now, this is a sample of what can be done uh, in your schools when we do the Fit India School Week. Uh, you could always have a morning assembly. Uh, this is when we come back to regular school. At the moment, we are all offline. We are all online. But it doesn't mean that we can, st we can still do this. We can still do a morning assembly online if you are using the platform like what we are using now. We are using Zoom and we have 10,000 participants now on this program. And uh, if your school has got a Zoom program or whatever they're, they're using, Teams or Google Meet or Google Classrooms, you can still do this in your schools. So uh, start off with assemblies and then have activities on fitness and nutrition for your students and your staff. This is very important to make sure that it is a whole school engagement. It is not just the students alone. You want every person in the school to be involved, the, the whole teaching community, the non-teaching staff, everybody in the school should be brought into this message about the Fit India Week. You can also have debates inside school, have student-led debates where the students are discussing the pros and cons of being active for life and people coming on with their personal stories about how they became fit and how they've been uh, become, uh, they started participating in more physical activity and the changes that have been made to their lives. You can also have drawing and poster making competitions you could have dance, yoga, martial arts, different kinds of competitions throughout the whole week where we are completely promoting this concept that you can do anything as long as you are moving. As long as you are moving, this is the more important word here, that you are moving for 60 minutes a day. That's the, that's the top. If you're able to achieve 60 minutes of physical activity daily, you are going to be a fit person. If you can't do 60, let us aim for at least 30. If you can't do 30, let us encourage people to do blocks of our fitness activities. Four minutes, two minutes blocks, and then accumulate them over the day. If you do two minutes now, and then after two hours, you do another two minutes of some kind of activity, another two minutes. Even this helps in the long run in developing your own personal physical fitness. And this is a message that we want to spread through the Fit India School Week how to develop your personal physical fitness. International Yoga Day, the gift of yoga, as I say, to the world community. And over the years now, International Yoga Day is being celebrated worldwide. Uh, lots of countries, uh, I mean, the, the UN has made yoga a big part of the uh, United Nations education program. UNICEF is promoting it in many countries. And the United Nations themselves are promoting it in many countries. So you look at it like most member nations of the United Nations are members of this International Yoga Day and all of them try to promote yoga in their own countries. So it is very important that when the rest of the world is following yoga, that we in India, we also make this effort 
to bring yoga into our mainstream in schools. Yoga is not a religious thing, as we have, many people might have this misconception. Yoga is about how you are going to develop your body through the practice, through the habit. And this is a, this is a habit. And you are, when you have this practice and this habit, this is going to become a skill for life. And this is going to transform your life the way you practice your yoga. When you are a regular practitioner of yoga, you can just do the basic, basic yogic exercises and you will see the benefits that you can get. If we can get this message to our children at a very early age, if we are able to get yoga into them in the lower elementary, the upper elementary, then this becomes a habit for them. As they say, like, if whatever we teach children before the age of seven, they become habits, they become life habits for children. So let's make sure that on International Yoga Day, that we are stressing the importance of yoga to our students in our schools. When you talk about competitions, we have a whole lot of competitions, uh, you know, which happen outside of school. And now when we, it could be a tournament, it could be a league, uh, it could be multi-sport sports festivals, it could uh, be a knockout tournament, it could be round robin, uh, whatever it is. Now, when your teams are going for competitions in other schools, it's very important that you have a fair selection. That every person in your school should be given the opportunity to come to the tryout and participate in the tryout and be selected or not be selected. And when somebody is not being selected, if the person wants to know why I was not selected, as a selector, it is your responsibility to also tell them the areas that they have to improve to be selected into the teams. And, you know, one of the stories that I always have about, uh, 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 about these PE classes and school selections is about a student of mine in one of my schools who used to try every year for the basketball team from class when he was in class nine. And uh, he never made it. Uh, and uh, he will come to the final round. And when I make my final 15, he used to get cut. Because the simple reason was there were 15 players who were better than him. And he would always come and ask me, like, you know, uh, uh, coach, uh, how can I improve? And I used to give him the advice that needs for him to improve. He would go and practice. He was very serious. But always there were 15 players ahead of him. In his final year in school, he came up to me and he told me, like, uh, he didn't make the team again. And he told me, coach, this is my last year in school. I want to be a part of this team. Can I be your assistant? He asked me. And, uh, you know, for the first time, uh, I never had an assistant in my, uh, for my basketball team. And I was so happy that a student told me, like, I, I would like to be your assistant. Like, I said, great. I mean, if you want to be my assistant, I'm happy to have you as my assistant. And I gave him a small job description. And this is what your job is going to be like. And uh, so after that, I had the most amazing experience of coaching because this particular student would take care of the whole session before I came there. He had the balls ready, he had the, whatever I needed for the session was ready. And when the session was on, it was, uh, if I needed the balls to be put, taken away, he'd take away the balls. If I want the cones put, he'd put the cones up there. And if I needed an extra player to play for a team, he was there doing it. And the next thing he knew, somebody got injured on the team one day before the tournament and he walked into the team. And he became a part of the team. And, uh, you know, this was, it was just his sheer interest of being a part of the team, even though he did not make the team. He wanted to stay with the team and he continued to be with the team and helping me as an assistant. And eventually he made it into the team as a player itself. So these are the opportunities that we had to provide our students in school when we start preparing our teams. Set goals for the team. Make sure your training practices are regular. And before you go for competitions, try and have matches. One of the things that I always also insist is to try and create a brand for your school teams to motivate your students. You know, most of our school teams just have the school name. Uh, now, if you look at the professional leagues, you find that this, uh, all the teams have got some kind of a brand. Uh, they could be like, we have, for example, we have the Chennai Super Kings with the Lions. Uh, and then you have the Mumbai Indians with something they have there. Uh, so you have the Delhi Dynamos in cricket. In football, we have different teams. So try and create a brand name for your team which can become a legacy in your school and that becomes a culture inside your school. The key aspects to look at uh, in, uh, when we talk about sports uh, events and competitions is why are we doing uh, these sports events? Who are we doing this for? And what, 
where and when. Only when we understand these four questions, the who, the why, the what, the where, and the when, we are going to be able to put up a, a good program. And before we do anything, we need to ask these questions to ourselves. Who are we doing this for? If my answer is I'm doing this for the kindergarten students, then why am I doing this for the kindergarten students? If my answer is I want them to have a fun day, so I get the answer for the what, I want them to have fun. Now the next thing is where am I going to do this in my own school ground and when am I going to do this? So to start planning. So all these aspects, when you ask these questions, you will be able to do better events. Now, when we talk about uh, the formalities for sports days, you know, most of us for sports days are extremely formal and a lot of attention is taken away from the participants towards the guests. And uh, this has been a culture in Indian sports systems that we are, the chief guest gets onto the mic and he's talking there for the next 20 minutes and athletes are waiting for the events to start. So it is very important that when you start your events that you have a time agenda and everybody is clear that we start the event at a particular time and we finish at the time. You need to have your time zones marked out very clearly. This is the amount of time that we have for each particular event. Try and have a rehearsal before your event so that you can run through the whole event and you can find out areas where you are going to be lacking. Now, when we talk about, you know, we always have the march pass, the oath taking, and uh, so that you, you know, these are all the regular parts of sports days. But if you can find different ways of doing this, always think outside the box. How can I make my sports day a different day? Because the template is established template that has been passed on for many years. And if you go to physical education colleges also, we are told that this is how you have to do a sports day. Nothing is written in stone. If you think that you can change it, if you can do a different way, please talk to your school management and tell them what are going to be the benefits of doing it this way. And we can do it totally differently. When you, the, another part that we always have is that when the event is over, you will find that the children have made to sit down for next half an hour, 45 minutes before they can be going home. The children have done a whole day of sports activities. They are tired and they want to go home and rest. The last thing you want is another person again taking the mic and speaking forever. So plan all these things very carefully and put them into your agenda so that when your chief guests and all the people come, they know that this is the timelines that you have. And then once you have given them a timeline, most people will honor a timeline. When you don't have a timeline and it's open, that's when people will start extending their own sessions. Now, when we are hosting an event, there are areas that we have to look at planning, budgeting, sponsors, marketing, media management, operations, experts to be involved and the infrastructure. We're going to go through them one by one. Now, when we talk about planning, as I said, now the thing starts with the who, why, the what and when. And that's where the same thing comes in here. We're first going to be looking at a date, fix the date. When we are going to be having a sports event, fix a date and then work backwards from there. How are we going to do? What are we going to be doing in that? Who are the people who are going to be involved? And everything that goes into making a successful event. But the more important thing that you have to always focus on when you're doing an event is safety. Safety is paramount to any event. Please make sure that you provide adequate support in your, in your event and have space to make sure that everybody who's participating there is going to be safe. Budgeting and financing the event, it's the big part. This is where it all comes down to. Uh, you know, what is your budget for the sports, uh, the event that you have? Uh, one of the major costs that you will always have whenever you're doing an event is the cost of the ground. Uh, if you have your own facility, then that's amazing because then with that, you take away a major part of your expenses and you can do it inside your own place. And then it's going to be about how you're going to set up how we are going to organize the people that are going to be involved. And if you have prize money, are you going to be having prize money or if you're going to be having just awards and medals and things, you can put more money towards that. And then make sure that you bring in, if you don't have experts within your own setup, you can always seek the support of teachers who are in the neighboring schools close by to you or 
experts within the particular sport from the state association or the district association to come and help you to set it up. Key areas here is to make sure that your facility is set up well in advance, cleaning up, uh, beverages, hydration, food, media publicity, and transportation. These are some of the areas that you, will, you might have or you may not have in your particular event. But if you do have these things in your event, it's very important to pay attention to these things. Sponsors play a very important role in the success of any event. Today, when we look at professional sports, you find that how uh, sports ma marketing companies or sports management companies help to bring these sponsors to support sports. So now for you, if you are going to be bringing sponsors to your particular event, it is very important that you start having a network of people that you can reach out to and ask for support. It's also good that if you find within your parent community that there are people who are involved in sports management or somebody who's involved in marketing who can give you support and give you ideas on how you can reach out to potential sponsors. And when you find sponsors, it has to be very, uh, the, the most important thing here is going to be the cost benefit analysis specific to each sponsor. When a sponsor comes in, the sponsor is going to know, want to know how am I going to benefit from being in your event? So you have to have a very clear image of when a sponsor comes in, you should be able to tell the sponsor, this is how you are going to be getting your mileage from being a part of my event. Now, for example, we have 10,000 people here on this. Now, if you tell any sponsor that we are going to be having 10,000 people on this platform, do you want to put a banner up here? They'd be very happy because they're reaching an audience of 10,000 pan India. So when you talk about your event, you've got to talk about the number of people who are going to come to your event, the participants, the visitors, the mileage that you're going to get, the eyeballs are going to be there. So this is what the sponsor is looking for. And when you have a sponsor, make sure that you have a very clear contract with your sponsor. It can be verbal, it can be a written contract about what each party is going to be giving and what they can expect. Marketing the event. Today, marketing is the most important thing for any event that you do. Uh, when we market an event today, we talk about the most important place in marketing is going to be the social media. We're talking about Facebook, we're talking about WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, uh, anything that you have where the presence has to be there. And that's where you're going to get the maximum reach. You can go with the traditional methods of uh, marketing through the print media, but that is going to be pretty limited today because very few people, uh, the habit of reading a newspaper is slowly dropping. People are looking for information online today. So the online marketing is more important than uh, having an offline marketing through uh, uh, print media. And if you're able to get the local radio stations, if you're able to get the local television channels to come in and support your event, that's even going to be better. But you need to make a network of this and reach out to them well in advance. And if you ideally have a, a media person or a public relations person, and this person will be the person who can pass this information on and help to market your event on social media. The same thing over here, I'm talking about media management now. Uh, you know, when uh, you invite uh, the media to come to your event, uh, media uh, expects certain things back. Uh, you need to uh, acknowledge their presence there first, make sure that they are given a proper space to sit down and watch your event and provide them all the necessary information regarding your event as either as a handout or in, in a talk with them. And uh, at the end of the day, make sure they are given full hospitality and access to technology if they need to print, if they need to send messages out or whatever it is like. Personnel management is uh, the key stone to success of any sporting event. You need to find the correct people for your event. So when you plan your event, you've got to identify the different kinds of personnel that you want to run this particular event. So for example, if we take a track and field meet, if you're going to be having a track and field meet, you want a starter, you want a starter's assistant, you want a call room, you want uh, the escorts from the call room to the start, you want the finish line people, you want the judges at the finish, you want the chief of the finish, uh, you want the timekeepers, you want the recorders, the, so then you need people for the jumps, you need people for the throws. So all these areas you need to find and make sure that you have already assigned people to take care of these particular areas. 
once you have found the people, it is also important that you delegate the authority to them to run that particular event. And everybody who's reporting to them, they know that this is the particular person that I have to report. So if I'm a person, if I am a, a judge at the finish, then I always report to the chief at the finish. That is the person that I report to. And whatever the chief at the finish tells me to do, that is my responsibility and my duty to fulfill whatever he's saying. So you have to make sure the hierarchy and the designation is very clear for the people who are going to be involved. Because you might be the main person, the tournament director or the meet director, but you cannot be everywhere. You have to trust the people that you are putting in charge that they will do the job and give them the adequate resources. This is very important. Make sure that they have all the resources to do the job well. Sometimes you may have to bring in paid personnel and then there's something again that comes into the budget that you bring in paid personnel. And also it is good before the meet, if you can get your people in and give them a rundown and if they require training, give them training on how to do what they're supposed to do. This is the area which is uh, the pre and uh, post event uh, areas, you know, uh, pre, during and the post. Oh, sorry, one sec, let me just go back. Now, before the event, you'll find there'll be a lot of people who are going to be involved in getting things set up. And then you'll also find during the event, everybody might be there doing their jobs and everything. But post the event, you'll find that 50% of the people will disappear, or maybe even 80% of the people will disappear. So one of the most important things is to make sure that your post event clean up and clearing out is all taken care of. We, are, we talk about Murphy's Law here. Murphy's Law basically says that you can prepare for everything, but something will go wrong on that day. So always be prepared to uh, have a plan B in case there's something that goes wrong you must be ready to tackle that situation. Monitor closely all features of the event on the day, throughout the event and have plans developed to immediately address any issues that may arise. You could have issues from injuries to personnel not turning up. You could have power failures. You could have equipment failures. So always have backups so that when you're, something happens, you have already thought about it. You have foreseen that it might happen and you are prepared. It's very important today that whenever we are doing events that we are making sure that we follow the principles of the three R, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, one of the easiest, well, the, the, the thing that would come to my mind straight away is water. You know, whenever we have a sports event or whatever, you will find uh, the amount of water bottles that are thrown around the space, the amount of water bottles that are thrown in the trash bins is tremendously high. How can we reduce this? If we advise all our participants and people who are coming to the event to bring their own water bottles, and if we have water stations set up where we have people can go and fill up their own water from that, then we can immediately reduce the amount of water bottles that will be wasted. Same way, try and reuse most of the things that are going to be used in your events from flexes uh, to whatever can be reused. Uh, store them and reuse them and something that can be recycled send them for recycling so it is very important that we always look at our sports events also from an eco-friendly perspective taking care of teams when teams report for your uh, competitions make sure that uh, your teams have got proper training facilities uh, the food is looked after the transportation and the security uh, if you're going to be having a tournament and there's a practice ground which is separate Make sure that you also have practice schedules for the teams so that they know that when they go at this time to the ground, this is their particular time for practice. And if they have a session, when they finish the session, the next team is also going to be coming there for practice, that they have to vacate the ground and keep the ground ready for the next team. So that's a quick run through about sports and events. Uh, as I say, thank you very much for being a part of this. And if you look at this picture here, you will see this young boy has got a T-shirt that says, Sports is the most powerful teacher of life. And we are all blessed as physical educationists, as community coaches, uh, to be teaching this to our students. And we are the most powerful medium for taking this message to our students. And one of the things I would say here before I end is the 21st century illiterate person is not the person who is not educated. 
the 21st century illiterate person is the person who is not willing to unlearn, relearn, and learn. Only when you are willing to unlearn what you have learned, to relearn and learn again, you can be a person who is called literate in this 21st century. And in our particular field, we have to do a lot of unlearning, we have to do a lot of relearning and learning all over again. So stay inspired and wish you all the best in your future journeys. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful presentation on organizing sports and events in sports. Sir, with your permission, let us move to the discussion part. So uh, I think we'll have, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, discussions. Uh, so the first question is that, sir, Sir, a question from your nursery class teacher. What kind of sport to be focused at the kindergarten? How many events or how many events, or how many games to be focused at the uh, at the uh, at the at the lowest level? Uh, when we talk about the kindergarten level, uh, the first thing we are talking about here is I said about physical literacy. So in kindergarten, we want to make sure that the children are having fun, and when we talk about fun here. The, the learning starts during the PE periods. So you want to be teaching them activities that are helping to develop their locomotor skills. So when you talk about locomotor skills, we're talking about running, walking, jumping, skipping, hopping, crawling, all the basics of locomotor skills. And if you can bring in the non-locomotor skills of bending, stretching, turning, and then the manipulative skills, which may not be easy for children in kindergarten, but they can start being exposed to the basics of manipulation of throwing and catching and striking. So if you have this there, you can always work on a sports day, which will highlight what the children have learned in the PE classes. This is very important when your, your sports day should be highlighting what the children have learned in their PE classes. It should not be something that we are just going to do on sports day. This is the learning outcome that children are going to take away from the PE classes. So whatever you have taught your children in the PE classes, highlight them on sports day. So it could be if you want to have a race, yes, they can do a 25 meter race. Kindergarten children can easily run 25 meters. They can do a sack race if they learn how to uh, move with the sacks. They can do a balancing race, balancing an object on a spoon or balancing something on their head. They can do basic team events they could do. So there are, it should be the most important thing here is to have fun. Make sure that you take away the competition element, but let the children totally focus on having fun. Another way that you can do this is not to have individual events. You can have stations. You set up 10 different stations where your kindergarten children can come on sports day. They can go to station one. There could be a group of five of them. They can go there and they can do some running activities. Then they go to station two, they can do some kind of throwing activities. They can go to station three, they can do some catching activities. So on that sports day, what happens is the children experience 10 different stations of different kinds of activities that are related to physical literacy. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, I have got, sir. And, uh, sir, I think uh, there are a uh, lot of questions related with uh, the type of uh, sport to be focused on the kindergarten. I think, sir, you have you had given enough uh, explanations on the on this part. But one more question, one more question, sir, related with uh, uh, the previous question. Um, how much duration is admissible? What is the duration for kindergarten uh, children? Uh, all uh, when we talk about are we talking about uh, I, I'm going to talk about two things here. One is about your PE class and one is about your sports day. So your PE class is going to be the standard 45 minutes. Uh, that's what you want to be doing for your all your classes. Uh, most schools have a 45 minute period, and in this 45 minute period, you're always going to be focusing with the first five to six minutes of having an introduction to the children, and then the next 30 minutes is going to be the actual session where you can start with your warm up. And then you're going to be doing the activity the children are going to be and then giving them a chance to use whatever they have learned in that class in a fun situation. And then the closing down. The closing down is very important for kindergarten children because when the session is over, don't let them just rush back to class. 
because the children have been taking part in physical activity. They are all excited. Their blood, uh, the, the heart, the pulse rate is high. Their bodies are warm, and they are all just jumping around. They're full of energy. So that before they go back to their class for the next period, you want to sit them down. This is very important. Have a downtime. Make them sit on the floor at least for five minutes and have a chat with them about what they have learned today. What are they going to take away from this class? And how are they going to practice this before they come back? So for five minutes, make them sit down on the floor, calm them down, then get them up, make them drink their water, and then go back to their class. Because some places you find that as soon as the class is over, they just the children run back to the class. And then the next teacher who's in class is going to spend the next 20 minutes trying to calm them down. So it is your job to make sure that the children are calmed down before they go back to the class for the next period. If you're doing a sports day for them, it all comes down to the weather conditions. It's not a very hot day. You don't want kindergarten children to be out there for more than one hour, one and a half hour maximum. But if the weather is good, if you're in an indoor space, you could also have it for two hours. So the weather factors are going to be conditioned and also the fun element about how the children are enjoying and having fun. Yeah, fine, sir. Uh, sir, and uh, in your presentation, I think you have uh, much explained about the color game and uh, the questions are repeatedly uh, about color games. Can you please? Uh, now the color run, uh, what is the color race? I just explained that during the thing. Uh, yeah. Okay, somebody has asked me in Hindi language, uh, a color run kya hai to jaisa am log holi mein powder dalta hai na ek ek dusre mein ek color run mein to school mein aap kya kar sakte hai ek a short road race hai it's not a marathon it's a short road race isme to 5 kilometer ka distance aap mark kar do bachche log ke liye to starting point to zero hai school ke andar ho sakta hai udhar to jab bachche log start kar rahe hai usi time to log hote hai ye powder dalte hai isme bachche log mein holi ka powder uh, ek hi color hota hai ek ek uh, jab, uh, so 0 1 2 3 4 so panch color hota hai isme so 0 mein to aap red color dalte hai bachche ke pura upar jab wo bachche log 1 km baaki 2 km point mein pahuncha gaya to udhar to dusra color to fekega so ye color fekne ke liye aapko do volunteers chahiye to aisa aap bachche log to panch panch km cover karke aane ke baad jaisa aap holi khelte ho aisa in ke upar to ek holi ka color hota hai so it is just a fun run like yeah yes sir uh, sir and uh, let us move to the next question sir uh, it's all about uh, the uh, residential setup schools sir in uh, residential setup uh, the question is that you know uh, the uh, a lot of students are not interested in in uh, p and sport and uh, teachers are also not interested to send the boys uh, to sport then how can we manage this situation, sir. How to motivate, how to increase the students uh, to take and part. This is in a residential school. Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, that is really sad. Because, I mean, uh, you know, not, nothing better like being in a residential school uh, where the students are with you. Uh, so, you know, most residential schools have some amazing uh, physical education and PT or uh, physical activity session. And they always start the morning uh, at six o'clock with some kind of physical activity where the students go out for a jog or they have yoga or dance or whatever they do. And that's when after that only they go for breakfast and then they carry on. Like So in a residential school, I don't see any reason why you cannot have a quality physical education program because the students are staying with you. They don't have a question of transport about going back home on time or my bus is waiting, my driver is waiting, I will miss my bus, I will reach home late. No, you, you, they are with you. They are a captive audience. So uh, there should be no excuse for not having a quality physical education program in school. But if the management is not supportive of that, then I think that is very sad. Uh, the physical education teacher has a real challenge here to convince the management about the importance of having a strong physical literacy, a physical active program in the residential school. Thank you, sir. And uh, the next question is that, uh, sir, how to motivate or how to inspire the athletes who are resist to take part or who are afraid of failure? Now, uh, see, the why do uh, athletes resist to take part? There are three things here. One is they don't have the confidence. They do not have the confidence because they have not been taught the skills. Only if you have taught your students the skills 
they will have the confidence and the motivation the desire and the knowledge to participate in sports and this is the foundation of physical literacy what is the definition of physical literacy we talk about when we talk about physical literacy is this is where we come through with it the knowledge the motivation the desire and the foundation to be active for life and many children what they do is when they realize in many schools you only focus on the elite athletes the natural athletes so the others what happens is you are supposed to learn by watching the others by uh, by watching your colleagues in school the teachers don't teach them there are many children who don't know how to skip and everybody expects that you should automatically know how to skip skipping is not an easy skill it has to be practiced it has to be taught to a child only when a child is taught that then can they skip but many people especially pe teachers will turn around and say you don't even know that how to do skipping yes i don't know how to skip because you did not teach me if you teach me the skills that are required then i will be confident to take part and this is where the problem lies that many children drop out from participating in sports and games in schools because they don't have a knowledge base they have not been taught properly so the role here is very important the role is comes down to the pe teachers in schools you have to lay the foundations in lower elementary in upper elementary and in middle school if you want your high schoolers and your higher secondary students to be actively participating in sports and games in your school high schoolers and uh, higher secondary students when they come to the board exams they have an easy avenue to escape they can be excellent students in the classroom and once they are excellent students in the classroom the school is very happy because they're getting 90% 95% and they will say oh, you don't have to force them to take part in sports let them continue in their studies and this is the escape route for many students and if you look at many of the toppers in the classroom they are the people who will not take part in physical activity because they don't have a foundation yeah fine sir and uh, sir with your permission uh, last two more questions please go please go on. yeah uh, sir uh, talents are found uh, and scattered in the rural areas in such cases uh, what are the what type of event to be focused in uh, rural areas in rural areas again see it's going to come down to most of our rural areas have got their own sports culture so like if you take for example uh, if you go to the deeper parts of haryana and things like that you might find that wrestling and kabaddi and all the physical sports are very strongly uh, a part of the the, the landscape there uh, so we have to look at what is the culture in that particular region and that is what we want to start developing in that region so because we cannot bring an alien sport from outside we cannot bring rugby for example and bring it to a small uh, uh, like you uh, bring it to a small uh, town and try and teach them rugby because they have never been exposed to rugby so but whatever are the existing sports in that particular rural area it would be ideal to develop that by saying this i also say that i go back to what i said the mother of all sports is track and field and track and field activities can be encouraged in any setting whether it is village it is rural it is urban it is a small town you can always do track and field there so if you are able to promote track and field in the rural areas that's amazing because but with track and field you are going to get better athletes yeah fine uh, sir and jeram i just want to take this one question i see uh, sunita mickey joseph yeah, why do yes, most sir. of the christian schools do not encourage surya namaskar Uh, i am going to take this one because uh, i had the same problem when i was teaching in dubai and i used to use the surya namaskar in my pe classes as a warm up activity and if most of you have done a little bit of research into it you will find out doing 10 surya namaskars can be the best warm up a quick warm up for your physical education classes and uh, when i started doing this i had a lot of objection from some parents who came up to me and who were christian parents and said that you are teaching our students a uh, 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 hindu religious thing i said why why do you say that the surya namaskar is an india uh, is a hindu thing no you are worshiping the sun god i said okay so you are saying basically because it is surya namaskar that you have a problem so what happens if i change the name to the good morning exercise or my warm up exercise do you have a problem with that and they did not have an answer so uh, you will have this issues with people uh, who who connect Uh, some of our yogic activities with religion so it's about us making them understand that 
that is not about the religious aspect it is about the physical aspect and the spiritual aspect or, or the bodily aspect that we are trying to promote with yoga yeah uh, sir uh, shall we go for the last question yeah up to you sir yeah sir uh, sir how to motivate the um, girls child how to motivate the girls section and the most of the parents they 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 deny to send the uh, uh, their, their uh, kids uh, to be so uh, how to motivate how to increase sir this is going to come down to the individual person in charge of the class i'm going to give you an example from my blind football i started the blind football in tamil nadu about 2 years ago and i was finding it difficult to get uh, blind players to come for my football classes but i had a couple of girls who came to me uh, and they said they want to start playing and when they came i was like you know i asked them uh, have you played any sports before and they said no sir we have never played sports and they are in college and it is very sad to realize that somebody who is 20 years old who is visually impaired has never had the opportunity to play sports and i said like oh, why did you come for football then they said we just wanted to try something like you know we heard that you are doing football we want to come and today i have more than 30 girls who come to my class uh, blind girls who come to my blind football class it is all going to come down to us as coaches and teachers how are we going to welcome the girl child into a class session how are we going to provide the confidence for the girls to come in there even if you are a male teacher do, doing a mixed class or even if you're a female teacher where you're having a class where your class is going to be gender friendly now if a girl child is coming to your class and has got a problem with some whether it is their periods or whether they have some a stain on their clothes how are you going to support them do you have a support structure which says hey don't worry i've got something that you can go and change if you have a stain if you need some help you can go to the restroom there and you can change i've got pads for you i've got this we need to start talking about how we are going to make the girl child feel comfortable in a sports environment and everybody should be able to respect this if it is only a girl school it's easy but if you are in a mixed school you need to make sure that your boys are also sensitized to how to support mixed gender sports in school and they should be welcoming of their girls when they come in and one of the things i very early said about inclusion is about not just about including person with disabilities it's also about including mixed gender sports the more that we start encouraging mixed gender sports the more we are going to be creating a society that is more respectful that is more tolerant and more understanding of women's needs yes sir uh, sir thank you so much sir for the wonderful presentation on organizing sports and events uh, in a school on behalf of ministry of youth uh, women and the child development ministry of youth affairs and sport kelo india fit india and sai lncp trainer i express my sincere thanks and gratitude to sri francis sebastian sir for accepting our invitation and uh, had given the vibrant uh, presentation uh, today sir thank you so much thank you very much and my best wishes to everybody who has taken part who has been here watching us stay inspired and all the best jai hind yeah thank you sir and i also thank the uh, thank all the participants who actively take part uh, uh, in the uh, uh, pe and community coaching program thank you and have a good day